Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a privilege it is to be here today with you, here in person with those of you online. And uh, what a privilege it is to worship and honor and give thanks to our God. Um, there's no better way to start out your day than with a prayer of gratitude, right? Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this day. The sun is shining, and even if it weren't, it would still be a miracle this day. The fact that we're here, we're alive, we're breathing. Every breath is a gift from you. Lord, remind us of that today. May we, may we go forward in the midst of this service, in the midst of our day, throughout our day, uh, remembering that it is a gift. Whatever may pass, whatever may come, Lord, we will give you praise because you are worthy, because you are good, and because you first loved us.
invite you to stand up as we sing this next song.
Well, good morning, everyone, good morning. on this crisp October morning. It's good to see all of you, and it's good to see all of our friends and family on live stream this morning. Why don't you just kind of, if you can, turn around and wave to the camera so they know we're all here. I don't know if they're seeing us, Jeff, are they or not? But it's good to have all of them with us as well. Just a reminder, your offering bucket is in the back to drop your offering checks off, and we continue to say thank you for sending your checks, using push pay, automatic giving, and dropping your offering in the back. The bucket's over here. In the back is for change for change. And we are going to be blessing some needy families in the life of our Lidditz community come Christmas time. I just have one announcement for you this morning. Joanne and Tony's class that they're teaching, Surrender to Love, is going to meet again today. It continues today at 11.15 via Zoom. But for those of you who are in the building, you can go over here to the fellowship hall. They'll be meeting over there. And if those of you who are on live stream want to join them, just contact Amy at Hosanna Lidditz to subscribe, and you can all be together through Zoom or in person. That's all I have for this morning. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Tony, who's going to bring us the third installment of Hosanna at the Movies. Thanks, Deb. Good morning, everyone. Whoa, that's not going to work. <laughs> Good morning, everyone online. Well, two weeks ago, 
we're in the third week of this series. Two weeks ago, we watched a movie about a man who comes to honor himself, both his breakability, the movie was called Unbreakable, and his superpowers. Last week, Joanne showed us a movie about a kid who comes to honor himself and those closest to him for both their grief and their superpowers. <laughs> this week, we're going to turn to a classic movie, 1978, filled with cheesy special effects about people who come to honor someone very much unlike themselves, both for his humanity and for his superpowers. Did you notice a couple themes there? Of course you did. One is honor, which of course is our theme for this year and for this series, honor everyone. And the other theme, kind of accidental, that this kind of emerging through this, is superheroes. And by that I mean both those who wear capes, I said the other week that in the comic book, it seems like all the superheroes wear capes. And those who are ordinary people who are simply attempting extraordinary things. And that's us. We who believe in Christ are ordinary, messy, broken people who have nonetheless become extraordinary because of the power of God at work in, in us. He came to live in our world with his own supernatural powers. And yes, with his own vulnerabilities. And somehow, by the grace of God, two Jewish boys in 1930s Cleveland created an enduring, appealing, fictional character with a story remarkably similar in some ways to that of Jesus. Let's watch. Because I, Marlon Brando, will always be with now. <laughs> the Gospel of John describes Jesus as also coming to earth from outside of us, but out of love, not desperation. He came to a world that he had created, to people that he had fashioned out of his own image and likeness, and he became one of us. John just says it like this, the word became flesh and blood. It moved into the neighborhood. Don't you love that phrase? We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. But just like Superman's mother here fears for her own son, who would be different from other humans when he arrives on earth, Jesus would not be appreciated or received by everyone. John talked about that as well. He said he came to his own people but they didn't want him. Not all of them, but thank God for parents. Well, maybe they'll keep him. <laughs> he doesn't have a family if we're out here. In this scene, Ma and Pa Kemp seem less like Mary and Joseph and more like Elizabeth and Zachariah, don't they? An older, childless couple who are astonished to have the opportunity to raise a son at this late stage of life, even if he is a bit weird. And we wonder a little bit if Zachariah and Elizabeth had to encourage John the Baptist to keep his own kind of weirdness hidden a bit while he was growing up. Paul Ken says to Clark, you are here for a reason, <clears throat> and it's not to score touchdowns. That was true of Clark. He was true of Jesus, who probably could have done some of the same things. And it's also true of you and me. Not that there's anything wrong with scoring touchdowns. And yes, I know this is the kind of pep talk we give their kids when they're small, but my question is, because I'm talking mostly to adults here today, do you know that it's still true of you? At whatever age you're at. One of our dear friends, age 86, chose to be publicly baptized the other week. <laughs> Obviously here for a reason. So let me ask you, what's your reason for being here? And let's be honest with ourselves. 
How much of our lives have we wasted doing something else? Trying to score touchdowns or whatever distraction has taken hold of you or me. And while we're at it, why has God put certain people in your life? And I don't mean just family and friends, the people you like, the people you choose to do life with, the people you want to be with, but also the people you don't get, the oddballs, the people you don't understand, people who set you off, the brads. Why are those people in your life? What gift or grace do they have to offer you? And what honor do you have to offer them? Clark's got a lot of thinking through to do to figure out who he is to be and what he's to be, what he is to be doing. But right after this conversation, Jonathan Kent dies of a heart attack. And Clark, with all of his superpowers, can't save him from that. After his father's death, Clark visits the remains of the spaceship that he arrived in, and he pulls out that crystal tube that his Krypton father had put in there. And then he concludes and tells his mom that he's got to leave. It's time for him to move on and find his identity and his calling and live it out. Just like Jesus eventually left home and ventured alone into the wilderness to be confirmed in his own identity and calling. That clip ended with another big question in this movie that's full of them. This is a question we've taken up in each of these movies so far, and the question that each of us must ponder in our own lives. Who am I? And as this story reminds us, we can't answer that question in isolation. It's not just who am I by myself, but who am I in relation to these people? Where do I belong? Who are my people? Well, Clark gets answers that are deeply disturbing to him. He has no people. He is alone in the universe, the only one of his kind. All the others have died and when the Krypton planet exploded. You ever feel like that? That you're the only one? That there's nobody else quite like you that's enough to connect to meaningfully? I suspect we all have in our life sometime. Some of us still feel that way frequently. Some of us maybe even feel that way today. The only one who can explain things to Clark is a hologram of a father now long dead. And the only one who can understand his uniqueness on earth was a human father now also dead. So here in the questions, in the aloneness, in the tutelage of his heavenly father, think about it, Clark begins to find himself, to understand his identity, his purpose, his abilities, and yes, his uniqueness. And we need that kind of experience as well. If we never have it, we will never ever quite feel at home in our own skin. And we'll never be able to totally honor others for their own skin, their own lives. We'll want what they have, or what they can give us, or what we can't seem to find within ourselves. And I, my guess is that most people live and die this way. I hope I'm wrong. But I think most people live and die never having truly come into themselves, never having truly come alive, and never having truly belonged to a community, much less welcome the stranger into their life. And the reason is because they are the ones who themselves feel strange or different or out of sync. You don't have to raise your hands to this, but anyone know what I'm talking about here? Anybody know what that feeling is like? This is, by the way, the primary reason God created the church, I believe. It's a community of those who are no longer fully at home in this world. Who are, as the Bible says, aliens and strangers in this world citizens of another better kingdom, but who are home in Christ, who are home in themselves, and who are home with each other. Earlier this week, in an email conversation, I found myself quoting another movie, 
which we will probably never show for Hosanna at the movies, <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody. <laughs> it's a movie about the rock group Queen, <laughs> which may have, ironically, the best definition of church outside of scripture. They describe themselves as, we're four misfits who don't belong together, playing to the other misfits. The outcasts right at the back of the room who are pretty sure they don't belong either. We belong to them. Isn't that awesome? The same is true here. We belong to each other because we belong to Christ, especially when we feel like misfits in this troubled world. I don't know about you, but I've been feeling more and more out of sorts with the world out there in recent months. There's just a level of bizarreness that's going on out there. And of course, it's been a hard year for nearly everybody. But I've been feeling more and more out of sorts with that, out of sync with that. But I have a people. I have a community of other people who are misfits and oddballs and outcasts. And my apologies to all of you if you don't see yourself that way. I'm not insulting you. I'm thanking you. <laughs> Anyone with me? Clark feels like the ultimate misfit. But that gives him the motivation to find out who he really is. So there in his fortress of solitude, reminding me so, so much of Jesus in the wilderness, with his father as his mentoring guide, he studies himself and he studies humanity. Who's, there's a part I can't show you here. I don't have time to show you. The, uh, he's, the humans are described as having a heart more fragile than your own. And our hearts are fragile, aren't they? We're so easily broken. He studies there for a very, very long time. Let's see if I can get the pose. <laughs> I look just like Christopher Reeve, don't I? <laughs> oh my, we'll, we'll explain this here in a moment. <laughs> See if I can keep my cape on my shoulders. You know, I wear this cape all the time, I just have to keep it tucked so no one knows my secret identity. <laughs> Again, this is the story of Jesus. He was the Father's only Son, and the Gospel of John again. In him was life, and that life was the light of all humankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's good news. That's our Gospel. But that's not all. See, because this is also our story. This is our story, too. For as Jesus came into the world to be the light of the world, so are we. Jesus said, you're here to be light. Bring it out. I love the way this is, uh, Eugene Peterson does his paraphrase. Bring it out the God colors in the world. Isn't that awesome? God is not a secret to be kept. No hidden identities here. We're going public with this. As public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm going to put you on a light stand. Now that I put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. And there it is. What we are to do with our lives, the purpose of our lives, our hidden identities, is not hidden at all. To be the light of the world. We're here for a reason. And it's not just to score touchdowns. We're here to shine the light of Christ in our lives. Given to us by the one who came from beyond ourselves. And who has given us our own identity. As yes. In one sense of the word. Superheroes of faith. So Clark now knows his true identity right? Right? And he's going to shine his true identity, right? He's going to live it out boldly in the world. He's going to fly back to civilization and announce that his real name is Kal-El, that he's from the planet Krypton, and that he's here to save humans from themselves, right? Or maybe not. You know the story. Let's watch. Well... Why did Superman continue to live an undercover life, even after he knew who he truly was? 
Who cares? <laughs> After all, he's a fictional character. The bigger question in a movie message full of hard questions is why do we, immortal glorious beings that we are, with the very spirit of the living God dwelling in us, live as mere mortals on our daily planet? Why do we settle for anything less than our true identity as the children of God? Why do we waste our lives chasing after all the other stuff that others who do not yet know that identity, who have not yet had an awakening experience with the Father of us all, that they chase after? Why are we so often stymied by our sin or the lies of the adversary? Do we not know who we are? C.S. Lewis reminds us there are no ordinary people you have never talked to a mere mortal. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors for everlasting splendors. And that's why I wear the cape today. Not to pretend to be Superman, the fictional character. We actually do not need him. But to remind you of who I am and who you are in Christ. Already. All of us. You too have a supernatural identity. And why would you possibly keep it undercover? Kal-El decides to live his life as Clark Kent. And Clark Kent is interested in Lois Lane. Walking with her after work that first day, he foils an armed robbery, stopping a bullet with his bare hands, but pretends to faint so as to keep his secret. He continues to bumble intentionally so no one will ever guess his true identity. And the question is, will he ever reveal himself to the world? Will he live out his mission in any way more real than just foiling a street robbery? Ah, we finally have an answer. Who am I? I'm a friend. And statistically speaking, it's still the safest, the safest way to travel. <laughs> anyway, well, let's look at how three kinds of people respond to Superman's debut to the world. First, did you see how happy the people down on the ground were as they watched him rescue Lois Lane from the helicopter? There's people, they need a hero. They want a hero. They want someone to rescue them when they need it exactly why many of the ordinary people of his day celebrated Jesus. He came to them in their terms, much like Superman is described in our terms. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He walked on water. He reminded them that they were not alone, that they were not powerless, that they were not invisible. They were seen and they were loved. They had a friend Boy, our world needs that reminder this year, doesn't it? Don't we? Have you had your moments where you've wondered if there, no, if there was somebody that could come in and rescue us from all of this? We'd love to have a superhero. And that desire for the one has fueled an awful lot of the polarization in our culture. Many people want someone, a politician even, to save us. We just disagree on what saving looks like. And can anybody do that, really? And then here we are in the church, already saved by Christ, knowing what our God is capable of, knowing even a bit, even if we keep it under wraps, what we are capable of with the power of Christ in us. Hmm. How are we cheery? It's the second group of people. This rescue and a whole bunch of others to follow it attracts the attention of someone with bad intentions. So we were reminded in the Unbreakable movie, every superhero has his opposite, a supervillain with whom he must engage in the eternal struggle of good versus evil. In Unbreakable, Samuel L. Jackson's character Elijah told us that there were really two kinds of supervillains, those who are physically dangerous, perhaps like the dragon in last week's movie, and those who are intellectually superior, like himself, and like Lex Luthor, the original nemesis of Superman claims to be. 
Lex's name suggests that he sees himself, ironically, as a protector of humanity. He's based, by the way, on the character of Adolf Hitler. This is 1930s, and a couple of Jewish boys who are writing, making up this character, who sees himself as a protector of humanity even though he's exploiting them himself. Lex Luthor actually sees Superman as the real villain because he comes from outside of us. We don't need someone to save us. We can take care of ourselves. It's one of the primary arguments people have against faith. Except, of course, that we can't. And we haven't. And we won't save ourselves. Look at this world. It does need a savior, doesn't it? And so have we needed one. Well, there's a third group of people who watch what Superman does. It's the media, which in the time that this movie story is set in the late 70s meant the newspapers. This would be the single biggest interview since God talked to Moses. Well, what did Moses report after his interview with God? The Bible tells us. Deuteronomy, the Lord set his heart in love on your ancestors alone and chose you, their descendants after them, out of all the peoples. But God is not partial. God takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, who loves the strangers, providing them with food and clothing. It's an awesome God, isn't it? What a, what a wonderful interview. Moses knew him. Talked to God face to face. This is a great and powerful God who has nonetheless chosen to love and rescue and care, and not just for me and my people, but also for whoever I would regard as a stranger, for the whole wide world. He honors everyone. And maybe then it's no surprise that Jesus came as a stranger to rescue us. Just like Superman, right? <laughs> well, Lois Lane gets the coveted interview, of course, and Superman tells her pretty much everything about himself. He tries to explain to her his reasons for being here, which are much better than scoring touchdowns. The point is, not only, is that he's not only powerful but good, and that he's going to be offering his power and his goodness for the betterment of others. And again, sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? That's a story of someone else we know. Someone who said in his own interview, I came so that they can have real and eternal life. More and better life than they ever dreamed of. Well, Superman then gives Lois a ride. <laughs> he holds her tightly to himself as they soar above the city in the night sky. And of course, she's afraid at first. But gradually, she learns to trust him, and she relaxes her grip more and more until they are flying side by side, held only by fingertips. And then she looks down. <laughs> and in panic, she lets go, and she plunges to the earth, second time in the movie, screaming all the way. She screams well, I guess that's how she got the job, until Superman does what, well, he swoops down and catches her, as we knew he would. This is the biblical story of Peter walking on water, isn't it? Trusting Jesus for a moment to do something that he couldn't possibly be, do on his own, something that could not possibly be done. Nothing in his experience had ever taught him that somebody could walk on water, but in that moment, Jesus is inviting him out of the boat, and he takes a few steps on that water, and then he looks down. His faith evaporates, and he sinks into the sea until Jesus reaches in and pulls him out as we knew he would. Jesus is not merely content, however, to catch us when we're sinking. He really does want to teach us how to walk on water. Metaphorically, at least, in the life that we live, to not be content to always be sinking. Now back to the movie, The Plot Thickens. And I'm going to speed up the story of it here a little bit. Many of you have seen the movie, and if you haven't, it's not terribly interesting at this part. 
<laughs> and the special effects are cheesy. Lex Luthor steals two missiles from the military and launches them in opposite directions. One toward Hackensack, New Jersey, for reasons never fully explained. And I, I won't make any jokes about Hackensack. And the other toward the San Andreas Fault in California. And Superman is now put in a no-win situation. Even he can't move fast enough, it says, to stop both of them. And then his situation becomes even more dire. For Lex Luthor has found some kryptonite. Now, we learned two weeks ago that everyone is breakable, including superheroes. That every superhero has a weakness. And this is Superman's. It's a meteor from his home planet. And it renders him powerless, weak. Lex chains Superman with a kryptonite around his neck and throws him into a swimming pool. Miss Teschmacher makes him kiss her before she will release him. Because she's just afraid that if she lets him go, uh, if she does releases him first, that, that he won't kiss her afterwards. <laughs> she was, had been Lex Luthor's assistant until he decided that he was going to blow up Hackensack, New Jersey, where his mother lived, where her mother lived. She saves Superman like the teenage girls rescued the rescuer in the swimming pool in Unbreakable. But you see, we find out something about Superman here. His weakness for kryptonite is not the only breakable thing about him. He also loves. And to be loved, to love is to be vulnerable. To love is to give oneself, sometimes fully, for the good of the other. And when it's true, godly love, it has nothing to do with worthiness. We sang this morning, only one of us is worthy. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, when we were the ones who needed rescue, when we were the ones drowning in the pool, Christ died even for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's never been about worthiness. It's always been about love. I like how the Superman character has matured over the de decades. 20 years ago, a popular song had Superman emoting that he's more than a bird, more than a plane, more than some pretty face beside a train. Just a man in a funny red sheet. And then the big line of the song was, it's not easy to be me. The Smallville TV series, later movies, humanized Superman even more, making him more and more like one of us, even allowing him to die like all humans do and to come back to life like Jesus did. We so much want our heroes to be human, don't we? So it's good for us to remember that while Jesus was fully divine and therefore resurrectable and has made us resurrectable too, he was also fully human, and he was vulnerable to grief and to love and to temptation and to death. So here's another question for you today. How human is your Jesus? How do you picture Jesus in your mind? Is he one of us? Is he like you? Is he human enough to understand and sympathize and have compassion upon you and your weaknesses? and powerlessness? How do you understand his love for you? Do you feel unworthy? In this movie, Superman does extraordinary things to see people threatened by these missiles. He stops the rocket headed toward Hackensack. He promised that he would. But the other one hits the San Andreas Fault and releases a terrible earthquake. And he heads in the opposite direction, acting swiftly to limit its damage. He builds an artificial dam to keep water from flooding a town. He rescues Jimmy Olsen who, from a collapsing dam. He dives deep into the ground to manually pull the fault line back together. But Lois is out there in the midst of it all, covering a story. And her car gets trapped in a crevasse opened up in the ground. And she is trapped in the car. The 
problem of men of steel is there's never one around when you want one. <laughs> Isn't it beautiful that it's just the car that's dead and not Lois? This scene, cheesy as it is, calls to mind the God who grieves over us, who grieves with us, and literally turns back time to rescue us. And that's love. And by the way, interfering in human history is not forbidden to him. It's what he's here for, to set the story right again. And so here, the story of Christ departs significantly from the Superman story. Superman ends the movie by capturing Lex and his hapless assistant, delivers them directly to prison, and then he goes off to rescue someone else or perhaps to return to his public identity as a mild-mannered reporter for a major metropolitan newspaper who looks exactly like Superman except he parts his hair on the other side of his head and wears glasses. Superman's got other rescues, other movies to do, but he almost always acts alone because he's the only one of his kind, remember? What Jesus did was better. He breathed into his followers his own spirit. And he told us that the person who trusts me will not only do what I'm doing, but even greater things. Because I, on my way to the Father, am giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. You can count on it. In other words, he replicates himself into all of us. And there's not just one superhero loose on the world anymore. There are millions of them, those who have breathed in the Spirit of Christ. And indeed, God's people have together done more in the world than Jesus did in Israel in three years. But we do not do any of it in our own power. For it is Christ in us that makes even the messiest of us and the most doubtful among us a Christ-resembling superhero in the kingdom of God. And this mission is not just given to us for ourselves. And Christians have sometimes gotten confused about that. But also for others. For us to honor the misfit and the odd duck and the stranger, all loved by the strange visitor from another plant uh, kingdom who came to rescue us all. And all means all. This movie has a happy ending, as maybe movies should. And so does our story. Or it can. You see, those of us who have invited Christ to live in us, those of us who wear the cape, We've read the end of the book, and it's not a comic book. It's for real, and it's good. And don't you need a bit of, good, a bit of good news right now? Well, here it is. It's not what's on the screen. Here it is. Look around you. Those of you online, look at yourself in the mirror. See Christ in you. And so today, if you've been living in that good news, I invite you to honor the stranger, the misfit, the odd ducks that God has placed in your life. Jesus does, because Jesus was. And who knows, it may be a stranger who will rescue us one of these days. And if you haven't been living in that good news, then here at the conclusion of a story of a fictional Superman, I invite you to trust in the reality of a non-fiction Jesus the divine human superhero who wore a cross instead of a cape, who gave up power in order to share it, who died so that you and I can live. And if you haven't allowed Jesus to rescue you, if you haven't invited him to live through you, if you haven't experienced the power of Christ to transform you, then why not do so today? right now. Take him up on such extraordinary love and find your true identity, find your true mission, find your true life. Because yes, Virginia, there really is a Superman. <laughs>